First, among apostles, Mary Magdalene's story. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. What a great pleasure it's been to be with you this week. Uh, I've really enjoyed these uh, leading lady studies over the past couple of years. It's been a pleasure, even during the pandemic, to be locked down uh, with such uh, valuable information. I, as I said to you at the beginning of the week, I've made more progress and will learn more new things on this particular study series than any other. Um, we were all sat there, well, actually maybe they weren't. I'm, I'm partially convinced they weren't in my bio before when I looked at the last <laughs> several decades. But the idea that, for example, Rahab would be presented as God's chosen midwife to birth his people Israel into their new land, or that Jael would fulfill the Eden covenant of Genesis 3.15 as a precursor to Messiah, or that, <clears throat> or that Rachel would be buried outside of Israel, uh, or that Delilah has been assassinated, or perhaps most extraordinary, that Esther has a secret Esther agenda to remove the indignity, to remove the disgrace from the tribe of Benjamin, from the house of Kish, from her own beloved ancestor, King Saul, and restore him before God. These are truly remarkable things. I don't want to sound too much like the letter of the Hebrews, but time has not permitted us to look at, say, for example, uh, Ruth, or to look at Jephthah's daughter, or Hagar, it's fascinating. Or even Eve. I, I thought at least I knew Eve's story. Apparently not. There have all been some very much big wow moments for me in doing these studies and in sharing them with you. I hope you've been able to enjoy some as well. Let's make a start then on our last story, uh, Mary Magdalene's story, entitled First Among Apostles. And I should say by way of preamble, if you actually want to access any of these classes or materials, uh, then you only have to remember johnpopel.com. That's my uh, own website. Uh, you'll know when you see these pictures of trees, or and there's, there's, there's a Bible verse right there. That Bible verse is from Isaiah 67. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently 23 of you will probably know what the verse number is. <laughs> If you click, say, on the classes, then all the various classes I've done are down there. Be warned, the leading ladies class is going to be two years old and not going to be the new ones that you've seen today for a little bit. Give it, give it a little bit of pause if you want to uh, hear these classes in this format or see the PowerPoint slide in this format. Take a little time to get there. Um, there's a little button there to contact me. You'll get my email address plus other ways to contact me. Uh, email is probably best. And there's even a, a, a little uh, tab there for books, various books, and the reason I point that out to you is I hope within months, and certainly within less than one year, because it's very nearly finished already, I hope to be able to present uh, this uh, topic, uh, Leading Ladies, as a printed book. And there'll be various e-books and various things that all these young people understand and I don't. Personally, <laughs> I prefer the internet when it's printed on a tree, and I can like turn the, <laughs> turn the page and find what I'm doing. <clears throat> um, there's also uh, a journal, Press On Journal, which is kind of a clever name for a, a, a journal, and they are publishing a variety of articles at the moment, including this leading lady's story. In fact, this month's issue is featuring the midwife in Israel story. They've got a whole bunch of formats. You can listen and watch a video. There'll be a podcast format of the next month, or you can read the article pretty much in its entirety, maybe even a little bit more detail than I had time in these classes. Anyway, that's enough of that. Let us press on with Mary's story, Mary Magdalene's story. Now, as a necessary evil, we have to do a little bit of detective work first and figure out which Mary is which. Because when we look at the Gospels, there's actually Mary, or Miriam from the Hebrew, uh, is an extremely common name. There's a maximum of six Marys in the Bible that we meet. When I say maximum, there's six, there's a Mary described in six different ways. We need to know which ones are which. Mary Magdalene is described as the one we're interested in. We also know that there's Mary, who's the sister of Martha and Lazarus, who lives in the village of Bethany. We also know that Mary is the name of the mother of Jesus. That's well known, of course. There's also a Mary who is the mother of James and Joseph. 
that shows up here and there. We also know that there's Mary, who's the wife of Cleopas, who's Jesus' aunt, and uh, presumably Mary's brother, sister to Cleopas, and Cleopas has married a woman with the same name as his sister. Complicates things even further. And when you just thought that was all very complicated and difficult, the Bible says, here, why don't we have another one called the Other Mary? <laughs> So there's a maximum of six. Um, could they all be one and the same person? No. Thankfully, there's at least one verse that helps out that says there must be a minimum of three. Because standing at the foot of the cross, as John writes, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, whom we know is named Mary, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, that's down here, and Mary Magdalene. So we know that at least these three are distinct Marys, but these three might be any of these three, or distinct, distinct characters. So possibilities balloon unmanageably. Do we really have to go through all this? Uh, yes, we do. I'm not just filling up time. I promise you, I'd rather get on with some real spiritual stuff. But we do need to go through and figure out who's who, because if we want to know all the stories about Mary Magdalene, we have to know if that includes any of these stories or not. So let's just press on and fly into the detective work and see whether we can solve which Mary is which. Let's start with Mary, uh, the mother of James and Joseph. She's mentioned here. No, she's not. This is a different verse, sorry. Um, what we learn from this verse is the argument is it's on a different topic, but we're given a very vital piece of information. When uh, the people in Nazareth are reluctant to accept Jesus as something special, uh, their objection, phrased very similar to the objection of Saul being a prophet, is not Jesus the carpenter's son? Don't we know who his father is? Why does this person think he's some special man? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And you notice that James and Joseph, those names there, are of course the same names as here, whose mother's name is Mary. Is that enough evidence to suggest that these are the two Marys are the same? I suggest not. That's a little tenuous at this stage. However, luckily, there's even more evidence pointing the same way, and that's through the parallel Gospels. At the foot of the cross, we have descriptions from different Gospels. This is the verse we've seen already from John. The people at the foot of the cross were Jesus' mother, and Mary the wife of Cephas, and Mary Magdalene. But if we look at the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, by comparison, it mentions two Marys, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, in both cases. So, given that it's very unlikely they're going to ignore that Jesus' mother is at the foot of the cross, therefore, by equating these, we can say it's reasonable to infer that Mary the mother of James and Joseph is Mary the mother of Jesus, knowing that his brother's name, his first two brothers' names, are indeed James and Joseph. We can therefore conclude that Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, is in fact the same person as Mary, the mother of Jesus. Okay, so we now have five Marys. Why? It leaves us with one question. Why on earth, if Jesus' mother is standing at the foot of the cross, why on earth would you say it's Jesus' mother? Why would Matthew and Mark go on and say, no, no, it's actually... That's actually the mother of Jesus' brothers. That would be a very bizarre thing to do. Unfortunately, there is a reasonable explanation. I say unfortunately, because I think what it indicates is Mary, the mother of Jesus' spiritual state at that time. She had actually separated from Jesus. I mean only spiritually. We see the evidence here. I'm not going to read that out. But she'd fallen into that trap, as had his half-brothers, of thinking, well, we're blood relatives. We're blood relatives, so we're kind of special. But we deserve special access. When we call for Jesus' attention, he needs to come to us, because we're the family. And Jesus flat out says, you want to know who my family is? They're the people who listen to what I'm saying, who do what I'm saying. That's my family. Those are my mother and brothers. You guys claiming bloodline access is a foolishness. And he'll later expand that to the Pharisees, who claim bloodline access by Moses or Abraham to being God's special people. Jesus points out the link has to be spiritual. It has to be obedience not just bloodline. Jesus' physical mother and brothers struggled to stay with Jesus spiritually, and therefore, I think the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, Genesis is Mark, 
uh, actually refer to Mary during that period of her discipleship when she struggled as saying, well, she's the mother of his brothers. It's, it's quite a powerful and meaningful statement. It's not just a, a foolish, uh, foolish thing at all. Let's move on and look at the other Mary. Who then is the other Mary? And we can solve that again from parallel Gospels uh, from those who are at the tomb. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary are the two who are sitting opposite the tomb of Jesus. That's the Gospel of Matthew. Now just flipping over to some parallel records in Mark, the two at the tomb are Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph. That's very handy because we've already solved that Mary the mother of James and Joseph is Mary the mother of Jesus. So therefore, we can see the other Mary is in fact, once again, Mary the mother of Jesus. Those three are the same. So we're, we're getting through our detective work and this is quite helpful. We've also hit our first piece of spiritual value. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were at the tomb. The other Mary is his mother. Think about what that means. When you go somewhere and they say, this great person and the other Tegan, right? They were the ones who were there at this particular place, right? You don't want to be the other one. The other is the lesser. So when the two Marys are presented together, the mother of Jesus is presented as the other Mary to Mary Magdalene, not the other way around. What's that telling you? And this is obviously very striking for anyone who's had a Catholic background or a Catholic upbringing. It's telling you that Mary Magdalene is being presented in the Gospels as superior to Mary the mother of Jesus. When the two Marys show up together, it's the mother of Jesus doing the other one. That's not meant to be demeaning at all. But it does elevate Mary Magdalene even above and beyond Jesus' mother, who is highly honored. Blessed art thou among women. That's a true blessing. Yet Mary Magdalene is half a step above even that. Finally then, the biggest question of all, what about these two? Is Mary Magdalene, who is very important to Jesus and very close to Jesus, equivalent to Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, Mary of Bethany, we might say, who clearly is also a character extremely important to Jesus? Are these two Marys, or are these one Mary? The first thing we notice, Mary Magdalene is translated reliably by all the experts as Mary of Magdala. I've heard it suggested, and you've heard it suggested, that Magdala can be taken off and try and mean something else. That is not recognized amongst any of the Hebrew professors. They say it's very simple, Magdalene means of Magdala. You won't find a disparate view on that. And yet Mary of Bethany clearly is of Bethany. So we say, well, doesn't two origins, one in Bethany in the south of the country and one in Magdala in the north of the country, suggest two different, pe two different people? And the answer is yes. Logically, of course, it suggests two different people. But not so fast. So for example, where do I come from? I am 2,500 miles from home. Now, you may or may not know, I don't know how many of you are sort of naturally oriented. Coming orthogonally out of this wall is pretty much the north pointing area. In other words, this wall behind me points pretty much east that way and west that way. California is over there. So I came to you from two and a half thousand miles away, roughly. I live in California. I've lived in California for 25 years. My home is two and a half thousand miles over there. Is that my home? Yes but well, I'm English. And when I go to England, I say, I'm going home. I go visit my parents or whatever, and England is that way. That's what the campus says. N is for North, E is for England. <laughs> e is <laughs> that right? England, West Coast. N and S, nowhere significant. <laughs> so, it's all falling apart. Emergency <laughs> button. Two and a half thousand miles that way. 
Where am I from? Literally both places. You say I'm from there or there, 100% correct. My home is two and a half thousand miles away. Which direction? That direction. And I'm telling the absolute truth. Okay. So two origins suggest two different people, but two different uh, people coming from two different places, but not necessarily. Let's explore that a little more deeply. What then are we going to do? Here's what we're going to do. Let's just make the best possible case from Scripture for there being two different Marys. And then let's make the best possible case from Scripture for there being one and the same Mary. And let's see which of those two cases holds up the better. Hopefully, one of them will hold up a lot better than the other. And fortuitously, I think that's exactly what we do find. So, if there's two Marys, why would we believe that? Well, we've already said one very sensible reason. One of them comes from Bethany, which is near Jerusalem. What do we know about Bethany? It's what you might call a shanty town, or in Spanish, a favela. It's one of these very unfortunate little uh, villages that lives on the side of a capital city. Uh, and and it's, it, it's usually something in poverty. Do we know that? Yes, because Bethany means, by translation, house of the poor or house of misery. We know that Simon the leper lives there. We know that the lepers were not allowed to live in the sort of upmarket regions of the capital city. They'd be pushed out to these much poorer villages. So Bethany, the house of the poor, is a village on the uh, um, eastern side of the city of Jerusalem, down in the south of the country. Various references. Whereas Mary Magdalene comes from Magdala. Magdala is in Galilee, way up in the north, and we know that she has traveled from Galilee, where she met Jesus, to support Jesus. Not just to support him emotionally and spiritually, but financially. She is actually, she and a few other women, are bankrolling Jesus' ministry and providing for his needs uh, in a logistical sense. And that's the other sense in which it makes good sense to say, these are two different Marys. Their financial status is drastically different. If Mary of Bethany lives in the house of the poor, she is poor. Bethany is the house of misery. Whereas Mary Magdalene, fairly obviously, has enough uh, disposable income to be able to assist others, namely, to be able to financially provide for Jesus' logistical needs as he focuses on the ministry of his father. So there's some good reasons to say these are two different people. That's our case for there being two Marys. Now let's look at the opposite case. Let's make the case for one Mary. And what I've done here is I've listed all the times that Jesus meets Mary. For now, I've kept them separate and said, okay, let, let's still say there's two Marys. This is where Jesus meets Mary Magdalene. This is where Jesus meets Mary of Bethany. This is where Jesus meets Mary Magdalene. And this is an attempt at chronology. Uh, this is before his ministry in Galilee. This is during his three-year ministry. And this is the very end, this critical feat time of his crucifixion, his burial, his uh, triumphant resurrection and appearance here. So let's just talk through what it takes to be true for there be, to be two Marys. And what we should see is the suggestion of there being two Marys is ludicrous. It cannot work. Jesus meets Mary Magdalene prior to the start of his uh, Jerusalem ministry up in the north, in Galilee, because Nazareth is in Galilee, and so is Magdala. And Mary's life is transformed. She is so transfixed by the presence and character of the Lord Jesus Christ, and his miracles, no doubt, that she gives up the life that she had and comes south with Jesus and devotes her own income to supplying for Jesus. Upon arriving in Jerusalem, Mary Magdalene apparently disappears for three years goes off on the world's longest shopping trip and pays no attention whatsoever, apparently, to the ministry of Jesus. But at the exact moment she disappears, magically, a second, different Mary appears. And this Mary is also utterly dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ. She listens sitting at Jesus' feet. She's the only person we know in the entire interior history that Jesus has actually called and requested to see She's the one who triggers his weeping, as we shall see, and she anoints him for his death. She understands the gospel me message like none of the other disciples did. And yet, when it comes to the fateful crucifixion for which she has anointed him, 
Mary of Bethany disappeared, never to be seen again. Luckily, at the exact moment that Mary of Bethany disappears, Mary Magdalene reappears and bravely stands at the foot of the cross. The foot of the cross that Mary of Bethany knew to anoint him for, but couldn't be bothered to show up to. Mary Magdalene, missing three years AWOL, is there at the crucifixion and at the burial of the tomb, and uh, brings spices to his body from Bethany, where Mary of Bethany lives, presumably from her own house, and Jesus appears to her first. Jesus once called to see Mary of Bethany. When Jesus is raised, apparently has no further interest in Mary of Bethany. Mary of Bethany is just a forgotten somebody, but Mary of Magdalene is, is back, and he appoints her to testify to the, to, uh, the gospel, uh, to the apostles. And, um, through it all, like Clark Kent and Superman, the two Marys are never in the same room at the same time. <laughs> His two most dedicated apostles, with the same name, never met. They never once showed up for the same event. And that doesn't make any sense at all. The only way that makes any sense at all is to understand very clearly this is one and the same Mary. Mary Magdalene is Mary of Bethany, is the sister of Lazarus and Martha. <coughs> All of these stories show her total dedication, her constant presence in the service and presence of the Master. That is therefore our solution. I think we can be very confident about that. One doesn't want to be dogmatic, but I think we can be very confident that that is the story that makes sense. So, Mary of Bethany, here is Mary Magdalene. They are one and the same. And the one thing we've learned about her, there are three Marys in total, as thus described. We're not going to look at either of these two. We won't have time. We will focus entirely on Mary Magdalene, the sister of Martha, and the sister of Lazarus. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. We have learned already she is the preeminent disciple, even over and above the mother of the Lord herself. Extraordinary, extraordinary stuff. Let's press on then and uh, look at her story. First of all, let's resolve those couple of difficulties. If there's two good reasons to believe that there's two Marys, like they're from different places and they're completely different financial statuses, how then are they actually one and the same person? And I think the best way to do that is just to tell Mary's story all the way through. Very simply. So this is going to go quite, uh, quite fast for the needs of time. Uh, this then is Mary's story in, in narrative prose. Mary is from Bethany. That's where she's born and grew up in Jerusalem or outside Jerusalem. She is sister to Martha and Lazarus. Bethany is the house of misery. Bethany is the house of the poor. Mary is poor. At this time, one of the other things we know about Mary is that at some time she was involved in prostitution. It makes sense to realize that if you are poor, that is the time that you will choose or perhaps be forced into a life of prostitution. Prostitution isn't a pretty subject and I won't dwell on it any longer than we have to, but there's an important thing we have to say about prostitution. You can't do it in your home village, right? You know everyone and everyone knows you. you know, your geography teacher shows up, it's all very awkward. That sort of thing. <laughs> so you need to leave town. And ideally, not just to go anywhere random, logically you go somewhere where there's disposable income, a rich place, and ideally a transient population where men will come and go and be away from their families. Ugly subject I don't know, I'm sorry for that, but it's necessary. Magdala of Galilee fits the bill perfectly. It's a port. It's also an affluent port. So you've got rich people there, and you've got a transient populace there. And of course, Mary Magdalene, or Mary, is unknown there. So she can go there and, pro and practice prostitution. She will therefore obtain money there. And if she's popular, I hate to say so, if she's popular, quite a bit of money and lavish gifts. Later, will notice that she has an alabaster jar of ointment that's rated in modern terms at about 50,000 US dollars. Right? 
This is not a family heirloom. This doesn't belong to the family. It belongs to her alone, as we will see. Distasteful as though, though it may be, this is logically where it came from. Then she encounters Jesus, who, of course, began his ministry in Galilee before he came south to Jerusalem. This is the important point. Her life is exploding. Her life is detonated. She is transformed, exactly as the Apostle Paul says we all should be. She is transformed, possibly, may I speak on your behalf, possibly more than any of us have been. At this point, she's ready to drop everything that she's doing, which was doubtless distasteful to her anyway. We learn also that she suffered from demons, which I should imagine are mental distresses, depression, anxiety, PTSD, whatever, and a godly woman in a life of prostitution may well suffer that way, but we've no time to go to explore that anyway either. The point is, Jesus has changed her life utterly. From this point on, she drops everything she's done before, everything she's cared about before, and she follows Jesus. And every dollar that she has, so to speak, is put towards the ministry. She then returns from Galilee with money to support Jesus and uses it that way. She brings Jesus to her family in Bethany. This is important. Without this, notice, let's forget the Mary, let's just look at Jesus. Jesus comes from Galilee in the north, arrives in Jerusalem, and it says, he taught in the synagogue and then went and stayed in Bethany. Well, how did he do that? How did he have this accommodation already booked? He didn't come from Jerusalem, he was from way up north. He didn't know anyone. How is it that a man can walk from Galilee into Jerusalem and suddenly have accommodation arranged for him in Bethany? With Mary of Magdala and Mary of Bethany being the same person, it makes obvious sense. Mary would have said, the moment we get south, I'll put you up. You'll come straight to my family home. And that's why this verse is key to say, well, he taught in the synagogue, went straight up and went to Bethany. The verse is otherwise so innocuous, that particular verse, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 17, has even been mocked in the cartoon The Simpsons. And it was a decent joke, but it was mocked because it was just so innocuous and meaningless. And the beautiful thing is, it's actually useful to explain that these two Marys are the same. It has a use, that tiny verse. She sits at Jesus' feet. She humbly listens and learns for the gospel message. She shares the tragedy of Lazarus' death with Jesus. She understands his teaching and anoints him for his burial. She bravely attends Jesus' crucifixion. I say bravely, and I mean it. Remember, the entire crowd, the entire mob, Jew and Roman alike, were begging for his blood. You stand up there and say, well, actually, I'm on Jesus' side. I don't know how well controlled the crowds are, I imagine not at all. You could easily have lost your life. But she's brave enough to stand there at the foot of the cross. Most of the apostles are not, they've run off. And Anne attends his burial. She holds a loyal vigil at Jesus' tomb. She's one of those women who bring spices to his body. And she is chosen by Jesus as the very first person to meet Jesus in his resurrected form. That's important. She also believes immediately there's no, oh, well, let me put the, my fingers in the hole. No, 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 no. She gets it immediately. And therefore, she is chosen by Jesus. She is ordained by Jesus to be the apostle to the apostles, i.e., take the message that I am raised to those who don't yet know about it, the twelve. You teach them the gospel message, and then they will teach the world. Do you notice that hierarchy? or at least that chain of command. Jesus shows Mary. Mary is sent to teach the Twelve. The Twelve will teach the world. And we teach that too, except we drop a bit about Mary. Always the Gospel is always said to come from the Twelve Apostles. But who taught that? Mary was sent to teach that. She's, in that sense, the perfect disciple. She that has ears to hear, let her hear. And I keep saying she listened to the gospel message when others didn't. Is that true? Can we prove it from the scriptures? We need to. Let's do it. Martha had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. And he's teaching them about his death and, death and resurrection. This is a separate occasion. Jesus is also teaching the twelve men. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and be killed and on the third day be raised. 
Mary came up to Jesus. This is the response of Mary to his teaching. Mary came up to Jesus with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head. She anoints him for his burial. She's listened, she's understood, and she's honoring him as one who will give his life for his people. Just as Esther was prepared to do, but not required to do, so Jesus is prepared to do, and will be required to do, and Mary sees that. Now, the men's response to being taught the same gospel message, Peter took Jesus aside and says, no, 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 no. All Peter's heard is that Jesus feels threatened, is that Jesus feels threatened by the Romans and they might want to kill him. And of course, Peter has biceps, or so is his, his projection. So he takes Jesus to one side, no problem. No problem, Lord. You think they're going to get you? They're not going to get you. Not as long as, I'm, not as, long as there's breath in my body, they won't get you. We've got this. We've got this sorted out. We're men. <laughs> they're going to protect him. Lovely. They're not listening. And so unsurprisingly, the reaction of, of Jesus to Mary and to the men is very different. Mary has chosen the good portion, Martha. It's not going to be taken away from her. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. By contrast, Peter, you're just in the way. Bless you, but you're a hindrance. You are not thinking about the things of God. You're just thinking about the things of men. And even here, John writes, the twelve still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Can you make out the chapter there? John 20. Jesus, this is post-crucifixion. Post-crucifixion, the twelve still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead, but Mary had just sat at his feet and listened and learned. Mary listens. Mary learns. The twelve didn't listen. The twelve didn't learn. And it's funny because there's a number of, of feminist movements who, uh, and, and it's also included in that ridiculous piece of fiction, The, the Da Vinci Code, who try and make Mary Magdalene one of the twelve apostles. And it's like, you know, okay, you're, you're trying to, to do right by respecting the women. Do you realize how short you've sold Mary Magdalene? She wasn't one of the twelve. That's ludicrous in many other ways. She was ahead of them. The twelve wouldn't listen. She did. She's the reason why Jesus wept. It's a very well, it's the one of the most well-known verses in all the Bible, right? It's the shortest one. Where have you laid Lazarus, Jesus asked. Come and see, Lord, the Jews replied. Jesus wept. Why did he weep? We can read right here. Then the Jews said, see how he loved Lazarus. So we think, well, that's why Jesus wept, because he loved Lazarus. It says so in the Bible. No, it doesn't. It says that's what the Jews thought the answer was. And the Jews tend to be wrong approximately 100% of the time. <laughs> this isn't why he wept. How do we know that? Well, we know that Jesus had known that Lazarus was dead for four days because he tried to tell the apostles. He's told the apostles, Lazarus has fallen asleep. Guess what? The men aren't listening. They go, oh, great, cool, he's going to be well rested then. And Jesus says, no, 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 he's dead. He doesn't cry. He doesn't cry when he knows that Lazarus is dead. He doesn't cry when he has to spell it out in little words to the twelve apostles that, that Lazarus is dead. He then comes home to Lazarus' uh, home village and doesn't cry. He then meets Lazarus' sister, Martha, and doesn't cry when he discusses Lazarus' death with her. So what was new? What was the trigger that made him cry? It's in the context. But it's not the verse afterwards. It's the verse before that we need. When Jesus saw Mary weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. He cried because Mary cried. He cried because he saw Mary's pain. That hurt him enough that he had human empathy to cry because of her pain that her brother was gone, even though she understood the resurrection. So the Jews shouldn't have said, it's because he loved Lazarus. It wasn't because he loved Lazarus, though he doubtless did. He cried because he loved Mary. 
And the Bible has said so all along. Let's look then at that very focal and central event of the anointing of Jesus uh, by Mary Magdalene. There's three records of it. Luke 7, Matthew 26, and John 12. And I'll say this briefly because I, I don't want to spend too much time on, on mistakes and errors, but it is commonly said, and that's the only reason I address it at all, it's commonly said, and it breaks into our community a little bit, that Luke chapter 7 is describing a different event than the other two. The only reason people say that it's a different event is because it occurs earlier in Luke's Gospel, chapter 7 and verse 24, and, and later in the, chapter, in the Gospel of Matthew and John. But none of the Gospels are particularly strict on a chronological order. So that's a very poor reason. In fact, no book of the Bible is very obviously strict on a chronological order. And more importantly, just look at the details. Are we really saying that there was some point early in Jesus' ministry when at Simon the leper's house in Bethany, a woman came along with an alabaster jar of perfume, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair, and then later, at Simon's house in Bethany, a woman comes along with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume and anoints her Jesus, a major deja vu moment. You think at the second event, they'd reference the first one, that some of the disciples would be going, why is this happening again? It's not happening again. It's fairly clear, to state the obvious, that these details made clear, this is the same event. These two Gospels go on to describe what happened afterwards, where Luke does not. But it's pretty obviously the same event. What's actually uh, nice to do, and we'll do a little bit of detective work here, is to look at the unique details that come from each Gospel. The details that one Gospel has that none other has. We learn that Simon is a Pharisee and also a leper. John's the one who names the woman in question as Mary. Simon sends out the invite to Jesus, which implies it's his house. And we know that Mary doesn't live there because she's come over and Simon isn't too pleased that she's there. He disapproves of Mary, but clearly he lets her in. Martha is serving at this event, so which implies it's her house. And we have another reference where she's served in her house before. And we're also told that the dinner is given as Martha's effort to honor Jesus for the resurrection of Lazarus. Lazarus has been raised, the sisters are unbelievably grateful. Martha shows her gratitude by hosting a special dinner in Jesus' honor. With all of this, how can we put this um, together? I think the simplest way is to say, Simon and Martha are married. That's, my, that's what makes this Simon's house and Martha's house, but not Mary's house. Some suggest, what if Simon's the dad of all the siblings? Well, then Mary would live there too. Simon lives in this house, Martha lives in this house, Mary does not. So logically, Simon and Martha are married, why don't they move out of this shanty town of Bethany? Well, Simon's a leper, so that's going to keep them there. So that's nice and sensible. Uh, Jesus has raised Lazarus. This dinner is Martha honoring Jesus. And the ointment is Mary's. She brings it over to Martha's house. That's very important. So when Mary comes over, she's bringing <laughs> her ointment. We now know why Simon let, lets her in. Martha is giving this dinner for Jesus because Lazarus has been raised. Well, there's only three siblings, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So Simon isn't going to not let Mary in. She has to be there, even though he obviously disapproves of her because she has once been a prostitute. Simon may also be a practical man. It's his wife's sister. You let her in, or you sleep six months on the couch. <laughs> Smart guy, he's a Pharisee, he's got a brain, you know, so he makes the right choice. Here's the important spiritual point. If it's not Mary's house, and she's got her appointment with her, then she's planned this. So realize what's not obvious in the text that springs out now. This is not a reaction from Mary in the moment. Just like Martha has planned the dinner, to honor Jesus. Mary has planned the anointing to honor Jesus because she understands the death and resurrection that must come. Mary therefore honors Jesus in a spiritual manner, far more deeply even than the excellent efforts of Martha to present uh, a lavish dinner.
for Jesus. I think that's what's important we can take out of this morass of detail. There's four events going on around the crucifixion and resurrection. The day before the Passover, which is the crucifixion, and those are the people that are there. There's the burial, those are the people that are there. On the Sunday morning, there's two visits to the tomb, one, two. A lot of names on that slide. Don't get lost in them. Don't miss the forest from the trees. I only want you to take one thing out of this slide. Mary Magdalene is there on all four of those occasions, and nobody else is. Nobody else scores four out of four. Mary Magdalene alone is the one who is constantly present, even though Jesus is dead for most of it. She still won't leave his side. She never left his side in life after she met him. She never left his side in death. I think the verses are best read to realize that when Jesus was in the tomb for 72 hours, I don't think Mary Magdalene ever left for 72 hours, except to go back to the village and make some spices to bring back to the body of the Lord. Let's emphasize that from scripture, the loyalty of vigil. Here's some nice uh, comparisons and also a nice puppy that uh, gets a good reaction from Peter. <laughs> you like the puppy? Um, just look at the words I've highlighted in red there. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went to the tomb, they did this, that and the other, and went away. But Mary Magdalene and his mother stayed there at the tomb. Peter and the other disciple, that's John, started for the tomb. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. But Mary stayed there, outside the tomb, crying. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away, wondering to himself whatever had happened. Joseph and Nicodemus came and went. Mary stayed. Peter and John came and went. Mary stayed. Who are you? I speak spiritually. Do you come and go in the company of Jesus? Or do you come and stay like Mary? Is there an important difference? Yes. What's the difference? Jesus reveals himself to the one who stays. He didn't reveal himself to Joseph of Arimathea, a good man, and Nicodemus, and Peter, and John. None of them saw him that day. He reveals himself to the one who stays. It's true then, it's true now, I suggest to you. Let's look at our closing scene, the final revelation. Jesus asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him and I will get it. Now Peter and John have gone. Jesus reveals himself. Thinking in human terms, Jesus has made Mary. Peter and John and Mary are all there. That's the best time. You reveal yourself to three people, not one. Think of the law. By two or three witnesses shall a matter be established. When they go back and tell people, they can cross-corroborate each other's testimony. It's the best time, logistically. But Jesus, who knows better than me, or you, knows that's not the time. I'm going to stand here and wait for Peter and John to go, because I know they're going to go. And when they've gone, and only when they've gone, will I reveal myself. So in this, in this instance, Mary is shown to be above, chosen for God's purpose, even more than Peter and John. Jesus is standing there in the shadows right there, just saying, I'm just going to wait for the men to go. Then the time is right. And Jesus says one word, Mary, just her name. That's all she needs to hear. She needs to hear just her name, and she knows everything. No questions. No need for explanation. She understands it all and cries out, Rabboni, not rabbi, not teacher, teacher of teachers. The one who will be king of kings and lord of lords, Mary already recognizes as teacher of teachers. 
The student of students, if you will, meets the teacher of teachers. Mary has only to hear her name, and she knows. And thus, Jesus honors her and ordains her. Go on then, go to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Tell them, I am risen. You alone will bear this message. Mary is ordained to bear the witness of resurrection to those who will be chosen to bear it to the world. The men, because the world will only listen to the men. But Jesus chose the woman to tell the men. Mary was the apostle to the apostles. Our last slide. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. What a potentially joyful scene. Is there joy? No. Why not? They did not believe it. They thought she was talking nonsense. Guess what? The men aren't listening again. Only she knows. She's willing to share. She's sharing. But they won't hear her. She's just a woman talking nonsense. And they can only think of the paradigms that are already fit in their own mind, and they cannot bend them to accept a new truth. And yet she is absorbed at all by just hearing her name spoken. For, so for that one moment, and for a little while afterwards, Mary is that kind of narrow bridge. She is that one person, like they carry the, the little Olympic torch before they light the big flame. She is the one person with a flame about yay high. She is the only one to carry, to hold, to gestate the gospel message. No one else will hear it. She alone bears it for a little while. Truly, therefore, she is the first among the apostles. I thank you for listening, brothers and sisters. That's very kind of you. I'll share with you just one observation from a comparison of seeing, well, we've looked at nine leading ladies. I've looked at 17. And one, one comparison, a few comparisons come to light, I'll share just one. What I've noticed is that the strongest elements of these ladies' stories are written very quietly. I feel like a fool for having read the stories of Rahab and Esther and Mary, and never once having seen the most important part of their life, not just some detail. It seems that the great achievements of the male disciples in the scriptures are written very plainly. And for reasons I don't yet understand, and maybe never will, don't need to. The greatest achievements of the female disciples in scripture match them. And yet, characteristically, they're written very quietly, or in a hidden sense, that you have to dig to find them. They're still undeniably there. And that's what I've noticed. That's one of the things that I notice is true uh, amongst all of those stories, and perhaps it's still true today. So brothers and sisters, let me suggest to you, you have leading ladies amongst you. And their achievements might be written very quietly. You might have to look and observe. Unlike the twelve, who did not believe what they heard, and always thought they heard nonsense, Listen to these ladies and hear them.